In this episode of Detroit Performs, bringing America's first genre of music to life. A photographer shares the stories from the neighborhoods of Detroit. And a weaver documents the history of an indigenous culture. It's all ahead on this edition of Detroit Performs. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding is also provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to Detroit Performs. I'm your host, DJ Oliver, and I'm at the 117 Gallery located in the Ann Arbor Arts Center. We'll be learning more about the gallery and exhibition throughout the show. Today's episode is all about revitalizing old art forms and documenting the stories and traditions of today. First up is the River Raisin Ragtime Review, led by William Pemberton. This group brings ragtime music to today's audiences while teaching them the history of the genre. We caught up with them as they rehearsed an historic collaboration with composer Reginald Robinson. Check it out. Ragtime, like America itself, is really a melting pot of cultures. It was a message of a, a people who were, I don't know, I'm quoting a friend of mine, a caged bird that was free. You could feel the freedom in the music at the, at the time. The joy, joie de vivre, you know, it just feels good. It makes you happy. It makes you want to get out of the suit and dance. Ragtime music started on the plantations in, in the South. And uh, it was advanced by musicians like Scott Joplin and Harry P. Guy and other ones. People should know that this is the origins of all the music that we have in America today. Blues, jazz, country music, all of it started with ragtime. Ragtime is the foundation of American music. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. It's a melting pot of different influences. I will say uh, you have uh, the, a lot of the African rhythms, and uh, you have uh, the, the march, the European march, which was very key in ragtime. The African rhythms were translated through the clave, uh, which would actually be what makes it ragtime, is the, the syncopation. Uh, then you have a, the a Latin harmonies and, and melodies. All this is, is add, put in in one time and uh, eventually it transformed into what was called jazz. I'm both a historian and a, and a musician. I'm, I'm trained as a professional musician. Started studying classical music. And so the, the blend of history and music is what attracted me to ragtime. River Rays and Ragtime Review came about in 2000. Two. I was the president of the Tecumseh Area Historical Society at the time. I had just written a grant um, through the Smithsonian Institute to bring a traveling exhibit from the Smithsonian to Tecumseh. It was an exhibit about the future. And I loved how interactive the exhibit was. And I'd sit back and I'd watch visitors come to this small town museum and be taken in. And I thought, why isn't music like that? Why aren't music concerts like that? Where you go and you hear the music and you learn more than just hearing the tune. You actually learn the history and you, and you find out why the person wrote that music or what that music represented. And that's when I started the, the group with kind of that intention of sharing you know, the importance of history and, and music. River Raisin Ragtime Review hires musicians from throughout the state and actually out of the state too. We attract musicians that share that mission of, 
uh, celebrating American history and music. And they are fine musicians. It's, I have to tell you, it's a little tricky finding the right players because the charts are orchestrated. They're written charts in orchestral key. So that takes classically trained musicians to be able to read well. But there's an unwritten style in ragtime, just like in jazz. Our director does a great job of explaining the pieces and giving us the history and the background. And so that's one of the things I really love about performing with the group is learning the rich cultural history and then also bringing that music to life to the audiences and really communicating and telling a story. Probably the number one thing that we're trying to get is a sense of style. Because if ragtime doesn't have the right style, it's not exciting. It corresponded with a great dance era. It has to have, people refer to ragtime as having a certain lilt or swagger. And um, if it doesn't have that style, it's, it's not going to mean anything to me. There's not a lot of flashy playing when, with the drums, but we do add a lot of flavor and you'll hear sometimes a lot of cowbells and wood blocks and whistles and sounds. So really adding a lot of color to the ragtime music and the ragtime era. Keep it clean and, and precise is, is what, what it takes to play the ragtime. The angularity of the melodies, uh, do-do, 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 okay, that sort of stuff, rather than uh, a nice da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da-da-da. Uh, so there's all these skips and, and harmonic changes. There's a harmony change on almost every eighth note in, in good ragtime. Uh, so every note on the page is relevant. Part of our mission is not only to to educate and entertain through the performance and preservation of ragtime, but we do aim to, to take the music forward and make it pertinent. This cultural harmonies program is a little bit different because this is all new music. It's a big deal that it's the first time since the ragtime era that a major collection of ragtime that's both composed and orchestrated by African Americans is being released to the public, both in print and via recording. This is the first time these piano pieces have been written out for anything larger than two hands on a piano. He's an amazing orchestrator, and uh, that's why I wanted him to be the person to orchestrate my music. He'll just make these arrangements up, and, and they sound right. I just hope we live up to the quality that Reginald has presented us with. Reginald does a great job of sticking with that vein of using, using Latin themes with African rhythms, with Western traditions. He's got a daredevil's gallop, which is, you know, he's, he's got a Mexican march. He's got tangos. And I think in today's world, that's really important to know that America is made up of diverse elements. I had very little freedom because I wanted to make sure that I could stay true to his his notes. Uh, so 80% of the notes on that concert are his. A few of them are some things that I added just for effect and so on. If it's not infectious to me, it's not going to be to you. So I have to make sure that I know how to make everybody feel what's going on. I don't know, it's magic. <laughs> they're they're a, great, a group of great musicians. I, I simply put it that way, great musicians. and they. They know, and I think William Pemberton really understands the music and uh, how it should be played. It feels like uh, being on a cloud. I actually felt that today. I was like, this is not real. <laughs> I'm actually hearing my music, pieces that I only play. I mean, I've been playing for over 20 years. Now I'm hearing it. I'm not playing it. I'm here. I'm sitting in the, in the back room listening, and I'm hearing my, my music played by uh, others. And they, and they really play it well. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's like unbelievable. You can learn more about the River Raisin Ragtime Review as well as all the artists we feature on DetroitPerforms.org. Next up, photographer Bruce Giffen, whose work is featured behind me, is documenting the many stories of Detroit's present through pictures. Take a look as he enlightens us on his art. Street photography is typically just grabbing pictures of whatever's happening and mine's a little more um, controlled than that. And I don't know why. I, I, I guess I don't see in action street shots that way. I see 
a store or a car or a person. And I honestly don't know with all the thousands of cars on the streets in Detroit and uh, you know parked in the curb and wrecked and messed up houses and messed up buildings and messed up people. I don't know why I picked this one over 999 other ones. I really don't understand, but there's something that attracts me to them and that's what I shoot. This is the street in Delray where I first met Brianna. I was driving around Detroit looking for people to include into my photography. And when I turned onto this street, there were 10 or 12 kids running around making do with what little they had. And the street was full of buildings and houses and just activity everywhere, it was alive. And as you can see, it's empty these days. House, a lot of houses have been burned. And every day, three or four more houses get burned down here. Brianna posed um, in, a, in some pile of weeds and it was interesting how the flowers, I noticed later that the flowers on her shirt matched exactly the flowers in the weeds that she was standing and <laughs> posing for me. I think a photographer has to be non-threatening and I don't think that's something you can do. It's something you either have or you don't have. And I seem to have it. So uh, when I meet people, I have a fairly quick connection with them. I only spend two minutes with them and somehow they trust me and they give me what they want to give me. I don't ask for anything, I don't pose, I take what they give me. And that's, that was just my technique and maybe that's why they look so real is because I'm not bossing them around and trying to make them look like they don't really look. I want them exactly how they look. And I'll use the best of that. I never made anyone look like a jerk. I always put the best of them out there because you know I respect them as much as I respect any human being. Okay, so there's this guy named Billy Bones, and everybody sees him around the street. He's sober, and I think he might have been an executive in a previous life because he's got a red suit with a vest and a hat and a pin and a pocket hanky, and he's got a blue suit, and he's got a white suit, all these things, and he always have a vest, and he always dresses like a million bucks. Now everything's dirty, and it's full of holes but he looks like maybe at one time he had a good job and just couldn't do it anymore and he just walked. I was with Henry and we were shooting a jungle gym that was covered in a blue tarp. Uh, people were living in it. So we wanted to document that. And suddenly I was surrounded by 10 or 12 high school students from the city. And normally I engaged them, but in this case, something was different. So I stepped back, opened the car door and Henry stepped out. And that's the end of the story because the size of him, they left they bolted as fast as they could move. So that's as close as I've come to any problem. Ruin porn. And this is Michigan Central Depot and the two words have become synonymous. Whether uh, when people come to town to shoot video or shoot pictures of Detroit and they talk about ruin porn, this is where they want to go. And they'll hire me and I'll take them around the city, but it always includes the train station. When I first started coming here 25 years ago, the word ruin porn didn't even exist. I used to come here and the, the building was basically empty. There were no fences around it. The doors were blown open and you could walk in and out free will, just whatever you want to do. At the time it was interesting. There were signs, there were baggage carts, uh, there were light fixtures, there was all kinds of stuff in here and it was really interesting in those days. So around 2001 I started teaching college level photography. And on Sundays, I'd bring my students into the city uh, to go into the, the train station in the Packard plant, Lee Plaza. Before it sounds romantic to you, though, please be aware that the buildings are dangerous these days because of the scrappers. And there are guards and police at every location, and you will get a ticket with no exceptions, and it's always about $250 or more. This is Squeak. Nine years ago, we were in the train station. It was five degrees. And we started hearing a dog crying. So we went, followed the sound to an elevator shaft, and we found her 15 feet down. And I, who knows how long she'd been down there. So uh, two of my students went down and fished her out. I took her home and she's been with me ever since. She's a little cuckoo from being in an elevator shaft for a couple of weeks, but she's a pretty good dog. I love to exhibit. I love framing. I love preparing, I love submitting, I love delivering to the place, I love the opening night, sometimes you sell, 
Sometimes you win and sometimes you don't. I've never really had anything stolen out of my car. I always tell people, if you stick your hand in my car, whatever you get, you can keep. Okay, so, so one of the motivations I have, and it's not really something I set out to do, it just sort of evolved, um, is to show people maybe in the suburbs north of 8 Mile that the city um, isn't as dangerous as maybe the media might have us believe. Um, I've been going to the city for 30 years and I've never really experienced any crime. And, I, and I'm not naive, I know there's plenty of crime that happens, but I do believe that it's between people who know each other. Uh, marriage and divorce issues and drug deals gone bad and stuff like that, but I've never seen somebody just casually being raped on the sidewalk or I've never seen someone get shot or anything like that. And everybody comes back and says, yeah, but, I, but that's time this happened. Yeah, of course it does but it's not the whole city. And if I've gone, I go into the worst neighborhoods day and night, anytime I want. I never even think about it anymore. And I've never experienced any crime. So who's right? The person that had their car broken into once or me who's never had anything like that happen. What's up guys, I am here with Omari Rush. He's the Director of External Relations here at the Ann Arbor Arts Center. How you doing Omari? Great, how are you? I'm doing good, man. So tell our viewers out there, what has the Ann Arbor Arts Center brought to the city of Ann Arbor? Well, the Ann Arbor Arts Center has been around for 107 years, uh, 43 of those here in downtown Ann Arbor. And you know, we're here to be a center for creativity, a hub of activity for the entire community, accessible to people of all ages, backgrounds, skill levels, uh, you want to learn about art, experience art, or just bump into creative people, the Ann Arbor Art Center is a place to come. All right, and so what's the mission here at the Ann Arbor Art Center? So uh, our mission is, is to inspire people through the arts and to be that place where people can come and express themselves creatively. To that end, we have art classes and camps so that people can learn about how to make pottery, painting, they can learn to draw, they can learn uh, digital illustration. Um, we certainly have exhibitions where we're showing the work of artists from throughout Southeast Michigan uh, in a set of 12 exhibitions throughout the year. And so what kind of artists do you feature here? Oh, um, you know, it, our calls are open to artists from all across the country. We tend to get a, a pretty large concentration of folks in the Southeast Michigan area and certainly Ann Arbor area because you know it's really important to us to have folks in our community be inspired by what people here are thinking and saying and expressing but also to equally be inspired by um, views that people have of what's happening around the world. Okay so what about this exhibition that's actually currently going on here now? Can you tell us about that? So the exhibition that we have up is actually going up. It's text and image uh, uh, curated by Jack Summers, um, a well-known artist in the Detroit area. And um, you know, the, the work explores the interplay of text and image. And the ways that text can change meaning, yeah. can have that twist of reinterpretation that you get sometimes when, when you see a word. And, um, and also, again, highlights artists in our area. So uh, we're really excited about it and we're just excited about the direction of what's happening in our gallery. And, in the organization generally. We're always um, looking for people that want to collaborate on different initiatives and projects uh, and so it's my pleasure to be doing that on behalf of the organization and um, really on behalf of the community. Oh well thank you for talking to us here at Detroit Performs. We appreciate that. Oh thank certainly you, my pleasure. All right now let's check out some events happening in and around the D.
To discover more events in Greater Detroit, visit ICSITY.com. That is so cool. For the Clinkin, an indigenous tribe from the Pacific Northwest, art isn't just a means of expression, it's a way of preserving history. In this segment, we meet a Clinkin weaver who tells us about her people's history through masterfully woven designs. take the, the fiber from an animal and a plant. So doing, it is the act of the weaving that puts me in touch with, with all that there is. And it's the wearer who feels all that power and energy. depicted in in everything and that was a way to portray you know our identity you know where we came from since it was a matrilineal society uh, but also it was our written language we wore our history in our regalia we still wear it We didn't have a written language, it was all oral, translated, you know, passed on from generation to generation. But with the oral history, there was always an art object that went with every story, that went with every historical event. The stories come from everyday life, whatever happens, uh, whatever it is that you want to preserve for future generations. We want to uh, tell the people where they're from, what happened, how did they come to be where they are. It's not just livelihood, it's part of retaining history. I call this piece Resilience and it's resilience toolkit robe. And what that is, it's like, it's a visual document of the ability of a people to adapt to outside forces that came into the culture. In that image, you'll see the foundation of our clan system, the eagle and the raven in the center. And then there's the outside influences. Within the eagle and the raven, you'll see the Alaska Native Brotherhood, A and B, and the A and S. And these civil rights groups gave flight to the rights of the indigenous people. And then at the bottom is uh, the tail and what that represents, the, it's the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute logo, and they are now the present day rudder as far as helping to retain and perpetuate the native cultures in present day Western society. Resilience, the ability to adapt 
so that we continue to, to thrive. I keep stories alive because there's always something to learn and even when the stories are repeated over and over and over again and you hear them, you know, 20 times in your life or 100 times in your life, right, you, at that stage in your life you always get something else out of the story. There they are, there's Lewis! <laughs> Look, little oh, socks, so little oh, socks, baby socks. Oh. <laughs> and when we tell our stories, they are a guide from the past through now into the future. That's why we tell stories. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. As always, for more arts and culture, head to DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on coming arts events. Also, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. We'd like to thank the 117 Gallery and the Ann Arbor Art Center for letting us come by here today. Next time you're in Ann Arbor, come on in. They would love to see you here. Until next Tuesday, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I'm DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding is also provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.